everyone. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, my name is Igor Matuszewski and I'm a maintainer of the RLS. However, today I'd like to talk about something different, uh, which is uh, integration, servo spider monkey integration that I did as part of my bachelor thesis group project. So this is the official poster. It's pretty neat. I found my uh, friend of mine. And here I'd like to thank my colleagues with whom I worked on this project. Their names are listed below. And also to Josh Matthews from the server team. Uh, that was kind enough to be our mentor. This one? Oh, yeah, okay, cool. And the aim of this talk is twofold. Uh, the first one is to provide some insight into SpiderMonkey internals and its challenges. And the second one is to explore how Rust actually made the integration safer in the process. So first, I will introduce Servo and SpiderMonkey, what it is and how garbage collection comes into play. Then we'll delve deeply, deeper into garbage collection concerns and types that encapsulate them. And finally, we'll talk briefly about compiler plugin that helps us uh, verify our custom logic. Uh, so chances are you've probably heard about Servo. This is an experimental browser engine that's written in Rust and it actually managed to bring some key tech components back to Firefox, most notably Stylo, which is a CSS engine that's written in Rust. But pro you may probably have not heard about SpiderMonkey, which is a JavaScript engine that's written in C++. And right now it powers both Servo and, uh, sorry, Servo and Firefox itself. So the main reason we use Rust is because it's memory safe. So the question is, the natural one, won't we sacrifice that memory safety when we integrate with a C++ library? Well, it turns out we don't have to. It is possible to, to encode many of the interface invariants using Rust type system alone. So now let's take a high level overview on how the integration works. Now JavaScript was designed to interact with web browser, although now JS doesn't seem to care. Uh, but, but so this means that web browsers expose a JavaScript interface that can be used to interact with them. So let's take a look at a simple example of how flow of information may look like. So imagine Servo is given an HTML document that is given, that is about to process. So what it does is it extracts the script, then it passes that script for evaluation to SpiderMonkey, which does just that and then call servo back for every browser API call. In this example, console.log. After that, servo executes its internal logic and finally, in this case, prints a simple string on a console. Okay, so let's talk about how garbage collection comes into play. Now, JavaScript was designed as a dynamic language and in a language as dynamic as that, we can create objects left and right, nest them in various hierarchies, even cycles, uh, while the references to the objects must, must still remain valid. And we obviously can leak memory for obvious performance reasons. Uh, thus, we must employ some form of automatic memory management. This means that we don't have to worry about borrow checker, right? We don't have to annotate our objects with lifetimes. So it's all good. But as it turns out, maybe not so much because it is costly it's more complicated to do, it incurs some runtime overhead, and we sacrifice determinism in the process. So in general, there are many ways to, to do it, garbage collection, and there are different algorithms, and they can differ on various axes, so we'll go into that in a moment. But in our case, SpiderMonkey has a tracing garbage collector with incremental marking, generational collection, and compaction. And while this dot, while this does not tell us much right now. We'll try to go over through some of those as we go. So first, it would be good to define what a tracing garbage collector is. So a tracing garbage collector, what it does is it determines that an object is alive, whether it is reachable by a chain of references to a certain set of root objects. And the rest that are not reachable in this manner are treated as garbage and collected. Uh, the, there are two ways, most notably two ways, to identi uh, identify those root objects. The first one is using stack maps, which is where the compiler emits specific metadata about each stack frame. So then during the collection phase, 
it can walk the stack and it can identify any GC pointer there. While the other case is when the runtime maintains a dynamic collection of active routes. So whenever we want to root an object, we have to add a route to that collection. Now, SpiderMonkey uses the latter, which is a global stack of pointers to the rooted objects. And to maintain that, it actually introduces a stack allocated wrapper value that is capable of rooting some, sort of, some set of primitive GC managed pointers. Some of them are listed here. So it basically follows an RAI pattern. On construction, it adds the pointer that it wraps around to the collection, and on destruction, it pops it off. And it is common to implement these root collection as a linked list. However, it is worth noting that uh, using a stack allocated value such as this, the order of destruction will be, in the, will be reverse with relation to the order of initiation of those objects. Therefore, we actually form a perfect stack. So how it actually works is, on construction, uh, we add the pointer to ourselves to the routing collection, and we only need to store the previous value that was there at the, at the top of the stack. And on destruction, we only need to replace the current stack tab with the previously cached values, thus logically popping ourselves off the stack. However, it is sometimes undesirable to use that type for performance reasons, or it's just straight out impossible to use. And to work around that, another type is used. And in this example, this type is called AutoGC Router. So in spirit, it is very similar to the previous type that I mentioned. It uses the same global stack approach. However, it can trace different things. Uh, it is internally tagged, just like, imagine it's like in Rust enum. Uh, that executes a different trace function depending on the type of the tag. So, for example, it is capable of tracing a fixed length array of objects, and, and it does that by using the type auto array router, which is a wrap around uh, the auto GC router with a tag array. And we can see how this is better than just using the router wrappers before. Imagine we have a collection of multiple elements, and previously we'd have to instantiate every wrapper help type for every element and is structured itself. While this is a constant time operation still, it is actually more performant, it stacks up. So in this case, we only add ourselves to stack once and with this we're able to trace through the entire collection. Another use case is to provide an extension point to the routing infrastructure. Uh, there is a custom outer router type with a custom tag that is actually virtually dispatched on, dynamically dispatched on, using the virtual tracer function. So it, it is convenient because in C++, what you can do is you can derive from the custom outrouter base class and, and override the trace function yourself. And with this instantly, you will be registered in the, in, in the infrastructure, but can still provide your own custom logic through, the, through this polymorphic function. So being able to trace custom objects is very useful, especially for servo, which may not have access to typical C++ um, amenities that are on the SpiderMonkey side. So this will be our goal. We we'll want to create custom routers in Rust, but still hook up into the dynamic tracing infrastructure that's over in C++ in SpiderMonkey. But this is not as easy as it sounds. Uh, we can actually very easily interact with C, FFI, and Rust, but not as much when it comes to inherent C++ semantics such as virtual dispatch. But Servo already uses Bindgen to create Rust bindings to the SpiderMonkey, and it is capable of understanding some of the C++, so you may actually use that and try and emulate C++ polymorphism in Rust. So our goal is to create an object in Rust and set it up so that the virtual function table is as expected by the C++ side. So on the left side, we have a couple of definitions. On the left side, there's a simplified definition of the custom outer router class. And on the right side, this is a corresponding structured data definition that's generated by Bindgen. We can also see that Bindgen was capable of converting the implicit virtual function table that's in C++. 
Here we can see the trace function that corresponds to a simple function pointer and the VF table as created by Bindgen. So actually to implement this, uh, we define a special trait that aims to be to act just sort of a like custom auto router base class. And to do this, we use a trick with an associated constant in a trait. So the basic idea is to create a constant VF table with explicitly instantiated pointers. And in this case, we initialize the pointer to our Rust method that's still unsafe in external C because it directly interfaces with C. However, what it does is it fiddles a bit with the implicit this pointer. And what it does next is it calls the regular Rust trait trace function. And you can see here that this is just a regular self-reference as you would expect in any Rust code, Rust traits. So the only thing that we need to do now is to implement this trait for, the, for our custom outer router wrapper type. And the interesting bit here is this. We actually construct the object using the data layout that's generated by BindGen, but here we actually instantiate the pointer to a VF table, just like in C++, to our associated constant. And with this, this is done just like in C++, where objects have an implicit pointer to virtual function tables. And in this case, uh, when C++ will do a virtual dispatch, it will go through this virtual function table that we defined over to our Rust method. But okay, uh, we've had our fun with, with VF tables, and this actually works, I can assure you. Uh, but we actually need to root the data. That's the point. That's the whole point of it, right? So we cannot, there's one problem. We cannot directly translate the C++ semantics because C++ has constructors while Rust has not. So how it differs is C++, when it calls constructors, it first allocates the memory uh, where the object will be stored at and then it calls the constructor with the implicit this pointer pointing to that area, that region of memory where the object will reside. And Rust, we cannot do that. We can only directly initialize values. There's no way to insert any special hook when constructing the data. So when we actually execute the constructors, this is what allows us to ergonomically insert the, the pointer to ourselves to the wrapped router value in the first place. Uh, so our solution is to mimic stood-sync mutex API, such that we'll have uh, our custom outer router type which only will be wrapping around the rooted object, but we also will have a custom outer router guard type, which serve as this kind of safe reference type that internally borrows the underlying custom outer router wrapper type. So on top, we have the simple definition for the custom outer router in Rust. It's wrapper C, and because it has the layout as expected by C++, and on the bottom, we have a simple Rust uh, method called root that constructs the, our helper struct, help, our helper, sorry, our helper view structure that internally borrows ourselves. So as long as this reference structure exists, we cannot move the underlying data in memory. And that's extremely important because when we add pointers to ourselves into the root stack, we cannot move the pointers around. I mean, we cannot move the data around while the pointers are still registered in the global root stack. If we do that and we create a dangling pointer, then when the collector goes through the roots, it will encounter a dangling pointer and will surely crash. So we'll violate memory safety here. So during, we can see that during the construction, we first use the unsafe function that registers the underlying raw pointer to the root stack, and then we create the safe reference structure that actually internally borrows the underlying data. And we can imagine drop is very similar. On drop, we call unsafe function that the reader, that the registers our pointer from the root stack. <laughs> so immovable types is, is, is an actual precise niche, niche use case for pin wrapper types. But the problem is uh, we did this when the pin type was not worked on. So we actually used the simple for a workaround instead. 
Originally, Servo wanted to support the custom outer router infrastructure to use another type called sec sequence router. However, the type on its own was not pretty on a C++ side. To root a generic global collection, it used 12 different template instantiations. So that's not really, that's not dry, right? But thanks how to Rust traits compose, this is equivalent to those two trait implementations, which is an implementation of tracing for option T and vector of T, where you can actually implement the tracing logic for the generic element. So at this point, sequence router basically boils down to a simple type alias. Now let's talk about write barriers. So what is a write barrier? In general, barriers are a piece of logic that's executed to synchronize some internal state. And in our case, write barriers are exactly this, but executed at the moment of write to an address that contains a GC managed reference. And it is needed to maintain specific invariants for different kinds of garbage collections. In fact, uh, we need write pre barriers for incremental marking and write post barriers for generational collection. Post barrier meaning we execute the logic after we do the write. But currently, server does not support the incremental marking, so we'll focus on the latter, which is generational collection. But first, a bit more about that. In practice, it has been observed that most of the objects that are created are short-lived. So what we can actually do with this knowledge is we can optimize our collection. In SpiderMonkey, we split, we split the heap into two, into nursery heap and the tenured heap. The nursery heap is where the objects, where the freshly allocated objects end up, while the tenured heap is when the objects are moved to when these survive a collector pass. This allows us to improve the collection phase by scanning only the nursery heap. However, there's a slight problem with that. What if a tenured object points to an object in the nursery heap? Well, we can imagine that this blows up because when we can only scan the nursery, we can collect an object that's not referred there. However, it is still being pointed to from an object in the tenured heap. So the solution to that is that we want to track the pointers, the values that are pointed to from the tenured heap uh, that we, sorry, uh, we want to keep track of the pointed to reference values in the nursery from the tenured heap. So in Rust, we'll do it as follows. We'll create a GC methods trait that aims to encapsulate all those right barriers concerns and we will then implement this for every raw GC managed pointer. In this case, it's worth noting that we have a post barrier method which takes an address where the reference was changed, the value of the previous reference, as well as the new one, which allows us to successfully track the changes. And for example, in the case of just regular JS object, we execute specific SpiderMonkey C API, just like below. But because of our write barrier, we require every mutation to go through our specific set method called, well, set. Essentially, the post barrier records the change of value at a given address. As you can see here, we invoke the post barrier method for the GC method implementee. Now, for the logic to be sound, we also need to do the same during the drop execution. When the heap reference goes out of scope, SpiderMonkey will not know that the value was invalidated now and it does not point to anything. So what we need to do is we implicitly inform SpiderMonkey that the value was set to, let's say, a null pointer. This clears the reference to any valid pointer that we may have previously pointed to. Similarly to routing, SpiderMonkey requires for barriered references to be immovable. Now this imposes some constraints. For example, this simple constructor-like function is memory unsafe. And let's go through how and why. So first we stack allocate our heap wrapper. Then we call set, which invokes a post barrier taking the address of the stack allocated heap wrapper. But then we return this wrapper value by move. 
And that's problematic because when we move value in Rust, we don't call the drop method. And so we won't reset, we won't inform SpiderMonkey that the references, that the reference was invalidated. Moreover, we won't invoke any construction logic when we move the value out. So there will be a dangling wrapper type at a different address that still points to, that may still point to a valid address in the nursery. So that's bad and unsafe. But uh, an obvious improvement might be to box all the things to uh, heap allocate first. And in this case, it works because heap allocation, the memory allocation of the heap allocation won't change. And here we can actually safely move the owning pointer around. So we invoke set function on a heap allocated value and it will correctly point to the location on the heap. As I was saying, that will not change, thus making the function safe. So this allowed us to fix some, some of the unsafeties in the code. Now, this wrapper type was used mostly in tandem with another type called router traceable box, which you, you may think of as the equivalent of the router wrapper type, but it's, it is dynamic. It uses a linked list underneath. It also acts like a box, which is an owning pointer. But because of this, and thanks to Rust ownership semantics, we can actually consume the heap allocated value and use it to create, to act as an, as an owning pointer ourselves, thus avoiding any runtime penalty and reusing the allocation. And it's safe at this point. Okay, so at the end, we'll briefly talk about the compiler plugin that was developed. Uh, this is used in a different context to root JS typed DOM API objects. Now, types change, but the core principle stays the same. We have a type GC managed pointers and dynamic roots, as I was mentioning previously. Needless to say, these GC managed values still need to be rooted correctly to be used. Now to verify that, we'll use a custom plugin. This uses the plugin register feature, which allows us to register our own custom attributes, lints, and more. To perform the analysis, we introduced two annotations, the must root annotation and the allow unrooted interior annotation. These annotations will be helpful with verifying the logic we want to. And this is a simple code that registers all of this. And as you can see, it's no magic, even though we interact with internals of the Rust compiler. So as I said before, the goal is to verify that the objects are rooted correctly. Now, this can be done by imposing some certain set of rules. First of all, any data that has an internal data marked with must root must also be marked as must root itself. So in other words, this means that must root attribute infects the outer type. Secondly, only objects that are, that are marked with allow unrooted interior are safe to contain the must root marked member data. We also disallow creating marked objects with must root on its stack because you can imagine a scenario where we store an unrooted reference to a GC managed object on the stack, uh, but then the garbage collector does its best, thus invalidating the underlying object. And similarly, uh, we also disallow to accept must root annotated objects as function arguments type because we'd like to have a guarantee that functions, that function arguments will be valid and rooted throughout the entire function call. So, Simplifying, we do this as this. We invoke a specific special declare lint macro with a lint identifier and default severity. And then we need to implement these Rust C internal traits. Now, the interesting trait is the late lint pass. It actually defines a set of verification logic that's executed for every item in our abstract syntax tree of our code. But in this case, we'd like to verify data definitions. So we'll use the check structure definition and check enum functions. And also we'd like to verify function bodies and their argument types. So we'll implement the check function call. And you can implement any other call for any other item, but these are by default implemented as NOAA. So you can only, so you can implement only those that you need. 
So simplifying a great deal here, imagine in the check function method that we want to verify that these arguments, that the function arguments are not of type that's marked with must root. So we can imagine that we have a helper type that checks all those necessary attributes because we have access to that by using tie type uh, that actually checks if the value is safe to be used or rather in this case is unrooted which is not safe to be used and if that's the case we can emit our own custom errors using the spanned lint API here we need to pass the identifier of the lint and also the range where the error occurs so consider this very simplistic example where we reuse the plugin that's used in Servo. We define a very simple structure that's marked with must root. However, down below, we define a function that accepts an argument type that should be invalid. And in this case, we'd like to pick up the error and for Rust C to emit the appropriate error. So if we run cargo check on this code, the compiler will actually pick up the error and emit the error just like it would any other out there in the wild. And yeah, that's all what I have to report for today. Thanks for listening. Yeah, question Questions? again, yeah. One question. Does anybody have a question? Okay. Okay, thanks.